All right, so let's take a look at ocean pollution. All right, check this out. Albatross bird killed on a remote Pacific island by ingesting a large volume of plastic delivered by ocean currents. This is a real picture. And it's pretty amazing, first of all, that all this trash would be on a remote Pacific island. And secondly, that the, a bird would eat it and ingest that much. So, ocean debris, some, some facts here. This is garbage that litters the ocean. It doesn't merely look ugly on beaches. Plastic bags, fishing nets, etc. can kill marine life. Of 115 marine mammal species, 49 are known to have eaten or become entangled in marine debris. And uh, you may have heard the importance of cutting up um, the little plastic strips that hold together six packs so that uh, a marine organism doesn't swim through one of those loops and get trapped and, or have it get trapped around its beak or its um, nose. Also, 111 of 312 seabird species are known to ingest plastic. And that's what they do. They're looking for food. And they, um, plastic is not a natural substance. It's a man-made substance. So um, they're not really tuned into that. The plastic debris also harms fishing equipment. So that's a problem on our human end. We can tangle nets that we're using and things like that. This is a picture of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, it's hard to get a good picture of this. Uh, it's a really unusual thing. Uh, what it is, is a huge convergence of garbage, mostly plastic in the Pacific Ocean. It's estimated to be bigger than the state of Texas. And uh, it's kind of right here in the middle. This is called the Convergence Zone. And um, it's not, and we call it a, some people will refer to it as a plastic island. It's not an island that you could stand on, but it's a patch in which there's a ton of garbage just floating. And some of the plastic, well, all plastic eventually will break down from sunlight, but it doesn't break down chemically, it just sort of breaks down physically. So it's still plastic, only it becomes smaller and smaller plastic pieces, which really becomes harder and harder to clean up. And that makes it easier as well to get into um, marine organisms through their gills or whatever. Another type of pollution is oil. We get much of our petroleum from sea. Um, let's get, let me get rid of this here. We get much of our petroleum from seafloor deposits drilled from offshore platforms. Some pollution results from this for sure, but natural seeps in such areas also spurt oil into the ocean. And we're used to seeing um, oil spills from tankers on the news that are transporting oil. They're what grab headlines. Though rare, these can cause damage locally, as we've seen here in Santa Barbara back in the late 60s. Um, but if you take a look at sources of petroleum input into oceans in metric tons, it's mostly from natural seeps. And our area right along here, along the um, Gaviota coast, just north of UCSB, going all the way up to Point Conception, that's actually has the third greatest amount of seepage anywhere along the uh, western seaboard all the way up to Washington. It's a lot of seepage and you see it if you go to Glead Beach you have to avoid or consciously try to avoid stepping on tar. Um, and some of it as you can see is related to transport and extraction, some leakage there. And of course we have oil that um, becomes a pollutant from our consumption, even from our cars. If you have a car that leaks oil then yeah, that oil is going to go on the, on the road when it rains, that oil is going to wash to the, um, the ocean. Another kind of ocean pollution is algae blooms, algal blooms. This means out of control growth of algae that kill fish and other organisms caused by excess nutrient runoff as from fertilizers. You may have heard it also called red tides because some types color the water red. And this particular microorganism here is the one that causes red tide. It is an algae and it's a microorganism, a dinoflagellate. You don't have to know this term, but um, it can be a problem. All right, let's um, shift gears to overfishing, another issue relating to our oceans. So we'll call this emptying the oceans. As bad as some pollution problems may be, the oceans today suffer most from overfishing. Oceans are vulnerable to the tragedy of the commons that we learned about earlier in this course. 
Depletion is not a new problem. For centuries, people approach fishing as if there's always more fish in the sea, which is, um, is true if it's managed properly. Fishing had already taken a toll on marine ecosystems many decades before ecologists began studying them. So um, really it's more of a recent thing to realize that we have to manage our fishery as well. So let's take a look at uh, a breakdown of fish populations. The most common category here is fish species that have been fully exploited, 52%. And um, what that means is that we are at the max of what we can possibly um, harvest sustainably. And many of them are over exploited or depleted or in some cases recovering. And a small percentage is moderately exploited or under exploited. So we really are at a max or exceeding the max of what we can get from our, our natural fish stocks. Here we see a graph that shows marine capture versus inland capture, inland aquaculture, and marine aquaculture. Most of the fish that we eat comes from going out into the ocean and capturing it. Um, and that has been true all the way back to 1950. But we can see that since 1950, there's also been an increase of inland aquaculture. This would be fish farming. Uh, marine aquaculture, where you're also fish farming, but right along the coast using salt water and inland capture, meaning fishing from lakes. Here we can see a breakdown of the relative contribution of aquaculture and capture fisheries to food fish consumption. Uh, worldwide, most of our fish comes from capturing it in the wild. But you can see here that a growing amount of it, and a, de a growing amount of it is from aquaculture, and a decreasing amount of it is from capture. In China, definitely a big increase in aquaculture, and this is from the early 80s going up to the um, early 2000s. In the world excluding China, we see again drops of um, capture and um, not a huge change in aquaculture, but definitely some growth of it still. We see here a growth in the amount of fish capture from the Pacific Ocean. Also a growth, a growth in the Indian Ocean, but Pacific Ocean, I mean the Atlantic Ocean has been pretty stagnant for the last several decades. We're pretty much fished out, um, you know, many areas, like take the areas off of Washington DC near the Chesapeake Bay, it used to just be overflowing with cod, abundant cod populations. Same with areas off of Boston Harbor, and now it's um, extremely difficult to fish cod from that area. They pretty much have been wiped out. So what kind of changes have we seen in fishery? Most volume today is pulled from deeper and further offshore waters. Uh, the stuff that's closer, we, you know, figuratively, we, figuratively we say the, the, um, the low hanging fruit has been pulled. So you have to go deeper and farther offshore waters to find fish. This means previously productive coastlines for subsistence fishing are now monopolized by international operations, leaving the poor to fight over the scraps. Subsistence fishing would be a family that's fishing to support themselves, which has happened throughout civilization for um, thousands of years. But now, because you have to go deeper and further offshore, you need the technology of large international operations. This would be a case where people are kind of fighting over the scraps. And um, another change is that we no longer have, we no longer think of fishing as a low-tech endeavor where you would do skin diving, hand lining, rod fishing, hand netting, etc. Nowadays, like this guy, this would be a traditional fisherman. But nowadays, it's more about fishermen using satellites and spotter planes, etc. So this is more of a picture of the modern fish um, fisherman with all of his tools and technology. He's got his sonar here. He's got um, all sorts of displays, all sorts of data. What are some industrial fishing methods? One of them is called bottom trawling, and it destroys whole ecosystems. Nests and bars are dragged across the bottom. They flatten the benthic structure of the ocean floor, and this is devastating to habitat for marine organisms. 
basically you're just scraping and you're getting whatever you can get. So here's a good picture of that. And um, you know, major, major damage. You're picking up everything under the sun. We see all sorts of sea urchins, we see crabs, we see fish, we see sea rays, um, all sorts of things. And these nets that you're dragging are going to catch large things too, like this hammerhead shark. There's another industrial fishing method called drift netting. This also causes high bycatch, meaning the unintentional catch, and ghost fishing, which is the unintentional catch by lost or abandoned nets, including drowning of dolphins and other mammals. In other words, these nets are out there, and um, sometimes these nets are lost or abandoned, and they still continue to catch fish unintentionally. So here's an example of um, drift netting um, on more of a kind of a, like a river or inlet area. Large, large nets. But you can see that sea organisms can get captured in those nets. And that can be devastating to all sorts of sea life, not just fish, but turtles. We can see major entanglement here. Other pictures. So this is not such a great way. Here's a third way that you should be familiar with called long lines that contain literally thousands of hooks on fishing lines several miles long, sometimes as much as 15 miles long, often catching and dragging bycatch great distances. So we have these boats, we have these very long lines. You see this is the bait applied to each hook, little chunks of other fish. Here's the Spanish long line system. You know, basically you have a buoy which is holding the line, you have anchors pulling it down, you have all your different uh, hooks here, and hand baited, lots of work, and then you have another buoy to support it and to radio some signals about where it is. Long line fishing accidentally kills thousands of endangered sea turtles and seabirds each year. It's a, it's, a, it's a known fact. Here's a turtle, a little graphic of a turtle with a long line hook in its mouth. And you know you could be catching it, but you could you don't even know about it. You're dragging it for miles through the ocean. Another illustration, and it's hard to free a fish that's been fighting a hook as it's dragged over miles of ocean. You know what can you do? It's probably going to die along the way. Um, if not, you, it's going to be so weak that the chance of of um, recovery are pretty slim. And let's take a look at aquaculture. This is hopefully a, um, a more sustainable approach to our fish, um, our, our need for fish in our diet. So here we have salmon grown on a fish farm. Fish farming means meaning the raising of aquatic organisms for food in controlled environments. Provides one third of the world's fish for consumption. 220 species of, are being farmed right now. And it's the fastest growing type of food production. A little FYI, we've seen this before. It's really increasing at a big rate, doubling about every seven years. Uh, most of what's grown by aquaculture is fish, but it's also mollusks, um, you know, things like um, um, scallops and aquatic plants, seaweed. The environmental impacts of agriculture, you should be aware of some of these. Number one, the density of the animals can lead to disease, so now you need to use antibiotics and that can promote antibiotic resistance in bacteria and also it leads, can lead to risks in food security. So if, you're, if a disease wipes through your farm, your fish farm, and you lost a lot of money and a lot of fish. And it can generate large amounts of waste in one concentrated area. That waste is very high in nitrates. It can really lead to eutrophication and other problems, uh, large bacterial you know, growth and stuff like that. Often these animals are fed grain, which is not energy efficient. It would make more sense for us as humans to eat the grain that we're feeding to the fish. Just eat it directly. Because even to ship the grain to the fish is going to cost energy. And then you have the energy loss as you go up to a higher trophic level. Then sometimes these animals are fed fish meal from wild caught fish. So how much sense does that make? You spend energy, fossil fuels going out to catch fish in the ocean, then you take these fish and you grind it into fish meal, and then you feed that to your um, to your aquaculture fish. I know, and all that, there's inefficiency, energy being used. And farm animals may escape into the wild and interbreed with, compete with, or spread disease to wild animals. 
Um, and there's a picture I want to show you right here and relating to that. These are transgenic salmon on top. They're transgenic. They contain a gene. Um, don't recall from where, um, but this gene makes them grow bigger. And it, they can compete with or spread disease to wild salmon on the bottom where they escape from fish farms. Let me know if you remember what makes them transgenic. All right, so some benefits of aquaculture, though, on the other side. It, they, it does provide a reliable protein source for people and increases food security, especially if it can be done sustainably, maybe in a low-tech way, um, in small villages. It can be small-scale, local, and sustainable. And it reduces fishing pressure on wild stocks and eliminates bycatch. It has the potential to use less fewer, um, fewer fossil, less fossil fuels than fishing. Watch my grammar. And it has the potential to be very energy efficient. Potential. Um, as long as you're not transporting over long distances. Okay. So um, that's kind of an overview of oceans. I'd like to have you write a summary at the end of your notes. And uh, I'll see you.